Training camp is around the corner, so we preview your 2017 Green Bay Packers with our friends from down under. Yes, the Aussie guys, their NFL podcast chatted with us about some green and gold teams. Plus, it's time for the podcast awards next on your Packers fan podcast. Hey, Packers fans, this is your unofficial Packers fan podcast, and these are the podcasters you're looking for. One of these guys, even though he's a huge fan of the Packers, he doesn't like bratwursts and wonders if that's wrong. And the other guy bangs the drum all day and thinks, touchdown. And now it's time to go, Pack, go with your hosts, Wayne Henderson and Troy Heinrichs. Thanks again for joining us on the Packers Fam Podcast. I'm at Wayne Henderson, your voice acting podcasting Green Bay Packers fan. This is episode 131, and it's so good to be back on the mic talking about Packers football, Troy. Yes, this is the Packers Podcast for fans by fans, and we are so excited that you guys are here to kick off the 2017 season in style. We have some friends from Australia that do a fantastic NFL podcast. They have been previewing every team, all 32 of them, throughout the offseason, and we had the pleasure of talking to them about your soon-to-be 14-time NFL champion, Green Bay Packers. I'm at Troy Heinrichs. Glad to be back with you again this season. How you doing, Wayne? I am doing well, patiently waiting for football season. It's finally less than 100 days away, so, you know, it, the end is near, and football will be here and yes, so great. Wait to hear our discussion with the Aussie guys. We're going to start talking like them, but not as well. AJ and Greg had a great time. And for some of the previous teams, I've been listening to their podcast, the NFL Fantasy Insight with the Aussie guys that, you know, for some of the teams they've interviewed, like the beat writer for the newspaper in that area, maybe a, a radio station host that really covers the team for the Packers. Uh, I'm honored that they selected us from the Packers fan podcast to represent the green and gold. Good times. Good times indeed. I'm going to be heading up to the uh, Cincinnati game this year, Wayne, for my Milwaukee package ticket. And I actually have a another first-timer traveling with me. Unfortunately, he'll be wearing the orange and black uh, since he is a Cincinnati fan. But uh, it was his 40th birthday recently and thought, hey, you know what? 40th birthday present, everybody should go to Lambeau Field. I think there's going to be a conversion taking place I at that absolutely field. absolutely think there'll be a conversion that day. Especially when we womp on the Cincinnati Bengals. That'll be fun. <laughs> That's going to be a great game to go to. At the beginning of the season, there's a lot of marquee Packers games. It's going to be so, so good. I I, uh, I hope you have a great time. Hey, where'd you find a, a uh, Bengals fan? Or just a friend from work and you realized he's a Bengals fan? Yeah, uh, uh, real life work, actually. So my real job, I've known this guy for a while uh, he's basically a, a colleague at another company, actually works for a podcasting company, if you can believe it, over there at Scripps uh, Midroll. So uh, definitely going to have some time, fun hanging out with him and going up to the game. But before we can even get to September 10th, we got to worry about July 1st. That's right. Shareholders meeting is around the corner. Training camp will be kicking off. It'll be interesting to see what all of the draft picks and all of the undrafted free agents are able to bring to the club this year. But before we get into any of that with the Aussie guys, we want to remind you that the pat, the uh, podcast awards are actually taking place right now. Yes. The nomination period is open. You guys helped us last year, secure a nomination in the sports category. And we're asking you to do that again for us. So if you go to podcastawards.com, at the very top of the page is a blue bar that says nominate. All you had to do is click on that nomination, fill out a little registration form, They'll email you only once just to verify that you are who you are. And then you just fill out your nomination ballot. And what we'd really hope that you do is, of course, pick the Packers fan podcast in the sports category. But if you could also pick uh, the Blacklist Exposed podcast in the entertainment category, as well as Beyond Westworld in the uh, TV and film category, and also the resourceful designer in the arts category, uh, since Mark Decote, who does the resourceful designer podcast, is responsible for that awesome logo that you're looking at right now in your podcast player as you listen to this episode. Uh, we'd love to shoot Mark some votes. So if you can, resourceful designer in arts, the blacklist exposed in entertainment, beyond Westworld in TV and film, and of course, your Packers fan podcast in sports, you only have to vote one time. So you don't have to do the constant voting like we had last year. This year, it's one vote. Just submit that as soon as you're done listening. Yeah, you can even pause the podcast 
go fill that out and then come back. But yeah, as soon as you're done listening, fill out that nomination form. We greatly appreciate it. Podcastawards.com. It's going to be fantastic. And because of that, we're bringing you this special episode before the season even starts. Yes, and we want to thank you again for all of your support last year in the Podcast Awards. It was great to be a finalist, honored to do so with uh, your help. And if you could do that again, it'd be fantastic. As you'll see when you go to the podcastawards.com in the sports category, there's just a few of fan podcasts. And it would be a shame if those Seahawkers got into the finals, but not the Packers fan podcast. They're great friends of ours as well. We're going to be seeing at least one of them at the Podcast Movement Conference. So let the Packers Fan Podcast represent. We're the only Packers podcast to be in these podcast awards this year. And this could be the year. It'll be great times. And between now and, you know, training camp. And uh, Troy, are you heading up to the owners meeting this year or uh, stream it live again? Ever since they started streaming it, it just seems easier to kind of hang back and watch the stream, to be quite honest. Um (laughs) But I am I am ordering a bunch of shareholder material off of the Packers Pro Shop. So definitely, if you have your control number, make sure you use your control number to go to the Packers Pro Shop and get your shareholder merchandise. Some really great stuff in there this year. And they only sell it that one day, correct? Uh, up, up in the Pro Shop, yes. But you can buy it from the website at any time as long as your uh, shareholder control number is used. Oh, okay. Cool, cool. Because, yeah, I got a cool cap and shirt last year. And people are like, owner? And it's like... Then I get the pleasure of telling them the whole story about the Green Bay Packers. You'll hear more about that with our discussion coming up in just a minute with the Aussie guys. Yeah, we should let everybody know, too, that the Titletown District, uh, the brewery, I believe, is going to be open by the time training camp starts. And the hotel is going to be right around the corner uh, there at the Kohler Lodge. And by the time season starts in September, uh, the majority of the Titletown District will be up and running for all the festivities. So it's going to be fantastic to have the park there. Uh, the kids can play on the playground, the area, the, the football field, uh, acreage, uh, where you can set up some tents, do some cookouts and whatnot. So Tuttle Town District's coming along. It's going to be a really, really fun time to be up in Lambeau this year. I cannot wait to make it back up to Lambeau and check out all of that. It, it, <laughs> if I could talk my wife into it, I would move there. Uh, you know what? There's actually going to be houses that you could purchase in Tuttle Town District that'll be going up for sale. I would love to have one. And I'm sure that is much cheaper than California. (laughs) Yes, that's for sure. Uh, Well, with that, shall we go ahead and turn it over to the Aussie guys uh, and learn more about what's going on with the Green Bay Packers and actually what, you know, they're not Packers fans necessarily. So we have some uh, pretty spirited uh, moments during the episode. Yeah, you might even hear a Falcon fan on the other side of the line. And he definitely rubs it in for us for that NFC championship game. But don't worry, we get our fair due back at him at the end. So, And what's funny is I don't think I've ever met a Falcons fan, but now I talk to one and he's all the way on the other side of the planet. There you go. That's where they belong. <laughs> With that being said, here's the Aussie guys and us talking about your 2017 Green Bay Packers. Hello and welcome. We are the Aussie guys. I'm AJ and here with me is G. How are you, G? Good. On a cold S- Melbourne morning. Sunday morning. Yes. Uh, it is a cold Sunday morning, and but look, we don't mind. We get up nice and early. It's uh, now our guests are certainly now. If they were based in their home city, man, it could get this, cold there. Oh no, this is not cold to them. The frozen tundra. <laughs> they probably yeah, well, t shirt and shorts. Yeah, that's without right. Our weather. That's without right. Winter anyway. You're in kind of you're in more sensible cities, boys. But uh, yeah, we have the. We have the guys from the Packers Fan Pod, and we're really stoked to be able to chat to these guys. We've got Troy and Wayne on the line. How are you guys? Doing well. Thank you so very much for having us on. We've been looking forward to this for quite a while, and you know, football season cannot get here soon enough. And you know, it is uh, Game of Thrones premiere weekend here in the United <laughs> States, so winter is coming, even though it is summer on this side of the globe. It is. A, that could I, almost be a byline for the Packers season. Winter is coming. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My co-host is, uh, well, he, he knows nothing of Game no, of Thrones. Ne- I think never he's, watched one second of it. He's the only person in the in the Western world that hasn't actually watched it, <laughs> I think. I've said to him that what he should do is wait till the entire thing is finished and then just watch it all. Because the pain of actually waiting between each season is, is excruciating. Uh, so if he hasn't started, maybe he should just wait till the very end. I, I just idea. finished... Uh... Yeah, I finished, what was it, six, 60 episodes in 20 days to get caught up for the premiere. 
Wow, wow. That is, <laughs> that's an awesome effort. Although once you start, it's not too hard, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> Sucked right in. <laughs> that's right. So listen, guys, let's talk about the Green Bay Packers. And this is, oh, man. I mean, an exciting team always to talk about. And certainly, um, let's just wind the clock back to 2016. Uh, it certainly was a less than stellar start to the year, 2016. And then we had Aaron Rodgers with his sort of famous uh, run-the-table remark, which led to a six-game winning streak to end the regular season, and then a pair of playoff games. Uh, The whole thing coming to a grinding halt in the NFC Championship game. Now, I must must warn you guys, my co-host is a Falcons fan, but uh, (laughs) a (laughs) 44-21 blowout loss to the Falcons in the championship game. But I must say that in that fi- in that final seven regular season game stretch, which was six wins and a loss, Aaron Rodgers in particular completed 69.7% of his passes, 18 touchdowns and zero interceptions for 120 quarterback rating. And he just went and reminded us, if we had any doubts, he reminded us uh, why he is one of the game's best quarterbacks how do you, both of you guys feel about, I mean, I guess you, you, you couldn't be anything but happy, really, I suppose, but um, how do you both feel about 2016 in general? Well, there's so many, like you covered, pluses and minuses. You know, we had that rough patch, getting a little concerned, but as soon as Aaron Rodgers says, we can run the table, you know the confidence is there, and then we just kept running the table. So things were fantastic. We knew that we had problems on defense, but we just kept winning. Now, the Falcons game, we knew that one was going to be tough. We did not expect for it to fall apart the way that it did. But uh, like Aaron Rodgers said in the postgame press conference, we just need to rebuild and you know not start from scratch, just retool a few things. And I think we're better than ever now. And just what a horrific end. Because as a Packers fan for over 30 years now, you just expect these days. You expect Super Bowls. You expect playoffs. And we're kind of spoiled, nothing less than that. And it's bad times. Yeah. It's, it's really shocking when you think about the fact that we have four division championships and six it goes and eight straight playoff appearances. You would expect at this point to have at least two, maybe even three super bowls. So to come into that Falcons game and just know that our defense for what it was, was just a, a poor sieve at that point. It, it, it was a, it was a long afternoon to be able to go out after just having such a dynamic season, especially coming off that Dallas game in the playoffs when Jared Cook caught that tiptoe at the sideline. I mean, it was just magical to see what they were taking on in the playoffs. And you thought you might be able to pull it out against the Falcons, but you know, they are a, a stellar team and Julio Jones, if he's on, he's on. And it, it was really interesting. They had a stat that came out after the end of the season that it's not that Aaron Rodgers. It, they were talking that Aaron Rodgers is is the Peyton Manning. You know, he like he can't can't win the Super Bowl. He can't get over the hump. He got the first one, and now he can't get back there. But it's really the defense that's been the issue because when you look at the losses the Packers have had in the playoffs, he's going up at against like a thirty two point deficit average that Aaron and the offense has to overcome. So really, it's the defense has been the, the crux of our pain over the last five seasons and. Really, we're hoping that that's going to be corrected this year. I'm glad you brought that up about the um, only having one Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers there. Now, Mike McCarthy's coming for a lot of criticism as well with his play calling when he's in front. Uh, I think, was it Greg Jennings was on a, on a show recently and, and he had a go at, at, uh, at Mike McCarthy and actually said that it's hard for the offense to keep, as you said, keep picking up what the defense gives away. But... With Leeds, he made the comment that he's not, he's not Bill Belichick. He's, he's not that, okay, we've got the throat and let's just grind them into the ground and, 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 and tear them apart and finish them off. So uh, how do you guys feel about the, the lack of success that you've had with someone like Aaron Rodgers at, at QB? And, and what is the relationship between the, uh, the coach and Rodgers at the moment? Because that was a little bit, seemed a little bit icy as well. Well, I mean, when you think about it, it's not that Rodgers is bad and it's not that the – the way things have been run has been awful. There might have been a little bit of a, a kermuffle in 2015 when we had the play calling switch over uh, to go to Tom Clements and then back over to McCarthy because even 2015 had a little bit of a rocky pillar 
in there coming off of that, you know, stellar Seattle Seahawks, you know, Packers championship game in 14. I mean, just disappointing that we didn't win that one because I was going to the Super Bowl that year if we did, uh, but <laughs> it'll be only like five minutes away. It's like, oh my gosh, did that really happen? But it, it, the the coaching staff, I think, has really, it's really a, a close knit group. I mean, it looks dysfunctional sometimes on the outside, but really when you think about the Packers organization, it's all about team. And I think whatever has been going on, if there was anything going on, it's been ironed out. And clearly everybody's on the same page to, to do six straight games in a row to win on any Sunday is difficult. I mean, look at, we've beat the lions for so many years in Wisconsin and one divot in the field, you know, breaks that streak. So we lose to the lions in, in Wisconsin soil. So coaching stuff aside, I think this is the year where everything has finally come together. I think we've made some really great acquisitions on the defensive side of the ball. Now, whether Don can actually put that stuff in, We'll see what happens, but if uh, we're in the same shoes again, Dom Capers uh, hopefully would be his last year this year. Yeah, now uh, you brought up the the comment from Aaron Rodgers about you know not needing to rebuild but needing to reload uh, in the wake of that loss, and he also said we need to make sure we're going all in every year to win. Now the interesting thing about the Packers is they've never really been a team that gets incredibly active in free agency. Like often I, I feel like the priority from Ted Thompson is often let's sign our own guys. We build through the draft. We sign our own guys. We look after that side of it and build a team that way, which has been like, oh, let's, let's face it, incredibly successful. But there was a little bit of action in free agency this year. Maybe, maybe just sensing that you just kind of need to, make a few little tweaks to get over that over that hump and back into the Super Bowl. So uh, coming into the building, uh, Martellus Bennett and Lance Kendricks, so adding a couple of tight ends, obviously Jared Cook leaving, a D lineman Ricky uh, Jean-Francois and a guard Ijari Evans, and also uh, leaving the building, so a few others on the other side of the ledger, I should say, guard TJ Lang, J.C. Treader, an O-lineman, Julius Peppers, James Starks and Eddie Lacey. So, you know, you know running back, you know, running back uh, <laughs> features in your, um, on your roster for a few years. Uh, your number one cornerback in Sam Shields, although he had some concussion issues. And, uh, and Micah Hyde, who was quite a, you know, quite a stalwart in that defensive backfield. So there's been a little bit of ins and outs there, guys. How do you feel about free agency? You know, in Ted, we trust. And in the past, like you said, he's done very, very well. But that is a lot of names to lose, to lose Lang and to lose Eddie Lacey. And then not re-signing Jared Cook had us concerned for a minute, but I think it was the very next day or shortly thereafter where they brought in Martellus Bennett and putting him and Lance Kendricks out there. We still have Richard Rodgers as well. You know, Troy even likes the idea where we maybe we'll put in a two tight end package and our running back, you know, is huge as well. And maybe teams just won't know what we're going to be trying to do. Yeah, the, the, the big thing that came up during free agency this year was how do we replace some of that loss on the defensive line? I mean, with the thing that went down, it, it was just sad to see how we we're trying to rebuild the secondary. But the secondary isn't any good if you can just run all day on that front seven. So to be able to kind of jerry rig and things that have been going on on the defensive side, I think that's probably where I'm the most nervous this year. And I don't think we did enough to secure that front seven on the defensive side of the ball. But when it comes to replacing everything on the offensive side, once again, you know, picking up Bennett, it's going to be huge because I was really shocked that Jared Cook wasn't coming back after, especially the things that he was able to do in that six game streak, which really elevated it with uh, Cook and Montgomery switching to that running back position. So to bring in Bennett, I think it'll be great. We're going to have some really interesting schemes, I think, with the three tight ends that we have. And it's still up in the air when you think about what could potentially happen on the defensive front side. Maybe there's enough of a shakeup you know, with that front seven that we might actually see people starting to sprint through the line with some of the pickups we had last year as they move into their sophomore seasons. Obviously, uh, you sort of mentioned in Ted We Trust, the big part of the Packers offseason every year is the draft. And it was quite telling that this year the first four picks were on defense – so you traded out of the first round just a little bit and you picked up cornerback Kevin King. Then Josh Jones, a safety, who's looks pretty good, looks pretty good. 
Outside linebacker Vincent Bagel and in the third uh, defensive tackle Montravius Adams. So they, that was the first four picks. And then, interesting that you loaded up on running back uh, with, j- with two picks, Jamal Adams and Aaron Jones. So uh, how do you feel about the draft? I mean, obviously talking about the draft is, is hard. It's very early days. But how do you feel about sort of the, the selection of picks and the positions that uh, Ted decided to focus on? Well, I mean, when you look at the running backs, you have Ty Montgomery, who was a running back in college, but then went to wide receiver, now converted back to a running back again. This will be his first full off-season camp where he can get the full scope of what it is to be a running back. So doubling down on the running back position in the draft, I think, was absolutely necessary because we didn't pick up a running back in free agency, probably because we didn't want to send the message to Ty that we were thinking about somebody else as the number one. I mean, um, Adrian Peterson's name came up a few times about would he actually come over to Green Bay for a one-year type deal. And the good thing that we didn't do that, because I think that would just be noise in a locker room, to be quite honest. So to go in with uh, two people that can build behind Montgomery, I think is actually a fantastic thing that we were able to pull off there. I mean, you think about Jamal Williams especially, because it's exactly what the Packers need, because after his stellar senior season year at BYU, it actually shows loyalty to a team, because when he had the... Uh, Kermuffle that he had junior year with his violation uh, being the type of university that it is. I mean, some players would say, screw this. I'm going to a different college and I'll finish my senior year somewhere else. But Jamal stayed at BYU, finished up his senior year there. And that's the kind of loyalty that the Packers organization looks for when they look for players to join the green and gold. So I think, especially with his ability to break tackles, I think that you get Ty running those first and second downs, and then you have Jamal, who's a great third down back substitute who could come in and get those third and shorts. Because if you have third and two, third and three set up that way that you can have Jamal come through and bust through, it gives you an option then that you can actually get the play action involved on those third and shorts, which could then open up the passing game quite a bit for Aaron Rodgers. When you look at the uh, other side of it, obviously on the, uh, on the defensive side, the thing that really was exciting about picking up King is that even though we brought Von Devin House back in uh, to the Packers organization after leaving in 2011, who will most likely be the number one cornerback with um, Gunther being on the other side and then Randall coming out of his slump last season. But the thing that King can do is that he can play both in the slot and probably in the safety position because he did play some safety in college. And that'll allow the team to really have some mix and match kind of personnel packages, depending on the type of team that's coming in. Sometimes you'll see Demarius probably play in the slot. Sometimes you'll see King play in the slot. I wouldn't p- picture King, at least in his rookie season, playing anywhere on the outside because he does have some closing speed issues. But I think picking up King and then also picking up a safety was uh, the right message to send that our secondary is not going to be to mess with this year. Yeah, but especially after how bad our defense played, especially any time in offense wanted to pass 20 yards it was almost guaranteed they were going to make it against us so we have to be able to stop some people so with this past draft getting so many defensive players especially early on i i give the packers a b plus or maybe even an a minus in the draft i'm very happy about it and very exciting Uh, excited to see some of these guys hopefully even make a impact even on their rookie season i mean and who can't be happy for vince beagle i mean you got a wisconsin badger staying in in state. I mean, this is fantastic. I mean, crowd's going to be behind him. It's just going to amp up his rookie year. He's going to play lights out football because he's going to be so amped up. I mean, it's just fantastic whenever Badgers can convert into Packers. All right, we'll go on to the, uh, on to the offense, and we'll start with the, the guy that controls the whole lot, and that's Aaron Rodgers, and yeah, arguably, well, if, you, if fantasy football's anything to go by, he's without doubt the best quarterback in the NFL, and that, you know, you put Brady in there for what Brady's done, but as as a pass thrower, he's without doubt the best. In 2016, he threw the ball more than any other NFL season of his career, 41 times uh, actually, and that's the second time he's gone over 560 attempts, uh, and we know the reason for that with the uh, the running game, with Lacey going down, and as you spoke about Ty Montgomery having to take over the duties there and the converted wide receiver. So we've got a full complement this year of wide receivers, a running back trio probably now, with Bennett added to the mix, the season ahead for uh, Aaron Rodgers. Oh yeah, it's going to be another fantastic season. Barring any injuries, 
he's just lights out. And even people that hate the Packers will admit that Aaron Rodgers throws the prettiest spiral they've ever seen. And he just recently, the other night, was named the NFL's best player of the year at the ESPYs. I don't know if the SB Awards air in Australia or not. And I was kind of surprised that even though Brady just won the Super Bowl again, uh, uh, he beat out <laughs> he beat out Brady to be the NFL best player of the year. So Aaron Rodgers on fire. I, I always worry that what if something happens? I'm hoping that our backup Brett Hundley takes leaps and strides this season just in case we need him. I mean, I'd love to see a future where we hang on to Brett Hundley and he stays with the team and can possibly be our next great quarterback. But for now, it's all about Aaron Rodgers. Let's not forget, though, that even when Aaron Rodgers went down with a broken collarbone, we still won the division that year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, look, but you would really probably uh, use the word piss off 31 other <laughs> franchises if you guys went and got another quarterback that became your, your franchise quarterback. Like, it's just... You can't go from Brett Favre to Aaron Rodgers and then all of a sudden Brett Hundley turns out to be this miracle worker as well. Just <laughs> teams are that. So like, if they don't hate you now, they'd seriously hate you if that happened. Well, remember, look at the age of Tom Brady, though. I mean, Brett Hundley is not the next Packers quarterback unless something drastic happens to Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers has still got a long runway to play yet. I mean, even if you wanted to even match Brett Favre. I mean, we're talking you know eight-plus years at this point. So unless something drastically happens to Rodgers' performance or he just decides to hang up the cleats, Hunley is not going to be the next Packers quarterback. So I would expect to see Hunley after this preseason most likely move or get traded, depending on how Callahan and some of the other guys step up to be that number two. Because we don't want to be in that situation we were when Rodgers went down with the collarbone issue. And then you're like, all right, here's quarterback this week. And then here's the next quarterback the next week. And oh, my gosh, what's going on? Those were shocking times. All right, we'll go on to the uh, the O line. So, in uh, Pro Football Focus, you're ranked number five uh, and the best pass protecting line in the NFL. Now, no one holds the ball longer than Aaron Rodgers outside of Tyrod Taylor. So, your best pass blocker was um, you'd have to pronounce his last name. Left tackle David Bakhtiari. 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 You got you're, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Your, uh, your best run block was J.C. Treader uh, and Dave, David Bacteri. Bacteri? I'll get it right eventually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, was your best overall <laughs> offensive lineman. Now, he only gave up 20 QB pressures, which is quite funny because actually Aaron Rodgers inflicted 23 quarterback pressures on himself last season. <laughs> so um, you got right tackle Brian Belaga who's a run blocker that needs to improve. Your left guard, uh, Lane Taylor, replaced Josh Sitton again, and, and he needs to work on his run blocking. And then in your draft, you pick up uh, Kofi Amiche, is that right, in the sixth round? So the line pretty much remains the same. Uh, so it's the status quo, basically. So w- where's the improvement come from the O-line, especially in the, in the run blocking game? Well, I mean, when you look at... Everybody that's there, you still have uh, Jason Spriggs, too, who's coming up, you know, from last year's class. So when you think about how this will all shake out, I don't think we have anything to worry about from the offensive line. I think the thing that really is key with offensive lines as the season goes along is that that same core front five stays healthy all year long. It's when you have offensive line men that go down for two weeks or four weeks or six weeks and you got to start cycling in things like. Uh, like a Patrick Lucas or a Kyle Murphy or a Justin McCray. That's when things get a little bit interesting. So hopefully we can keep, you know, Bakhtiari, Lane Taylor, Corey Lindsay, uh, and uh, Jahari Evans and Brian Balaga up there on the front of the line and then cycle in Jason Spriggs and Kofi. And I hate to say it, Wayne, Don Barkley every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> Barkley, please, so human, please, please. <laughs> human turnstile. Um, but <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it It looks like things will be fine. for The The offense is the same offense as it was last year. It'll just be interesting to see how we move the tight ends into the package and what we can do with those tight ends because they're bigger guys and they run down the field a lot faster. So it'll be interesting to see what Aaron does with them. All right, we'll move on to the running backs then. And we'll, as we spoke about, Adrian said Lacey left. He finds himself now in Seattle. Uh, and t- and look, he, he missed most of the last season anyway with uh, being injured. Ty Montgomery took over, and 
77 rushes, 457 yards, and only three TDs, but averaged 5.9 yards a carry. Didn't score any touchdowns as a receiving uh, out of the backfield. So you guys go, and as we spoke about, you go into the draft, and you um, you pick up a couple of guys. Uh, you picked up three, actually. You picked up Jamal Williams, Aaron Jones out of Texas El Paso, and in the seventh, you pick up Devontae May out of Utah State. So... McCarthy's come out and said, Montgomery, absolutely the starter. Now, the Packers finished 20th in rushing last season. So give us a storyline of the Packers backfield for 2017. Well, I think Ty Montgomery is definitely the go-to guy. He proved it in what little time he had in the running back position last year. And like Troy talked on earlier, with the fact that he's had a full off season to get into the running back groove again, I think he's going to be just fine. And of course, the first game of the year will get... Um, Lacey and the Seahawks out of the way. So it can be the Ty Montgomery show. And I'm expecting more brilliance also from our fullback Ripkowski this season because the Packers, you know, when we've got a good, sturdy bulldozer of a fullback like Ripkowski, good things are going to happen. But I'm glad that we drafted those other running backs because we literally were down to, <laughs> I think, one person it, it, at the end of last season. So it, the more the merrier, but Ty Montgomery and Ripkowski are going to steal the show. And I know the fantasy teams, people are happy because you can actually play Montgomery as a running back this year. So <laughs> you can get your double the points on the runs and the catches that he'll be doing out of the backfield. Because remember, he did play that receiver position. So Montgomery is a double threat in a lot of ways. And I think that's the thing that's going to be the most exciting is to see what he can do as far as coming out of the backfield in the passing game and also see how much of an extra run blocker he can be on those five, six, seven, eight, nine second time when Rogers wants to hang onto the ball for half a quarter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it'll be, <laughs> it'll be great to see if the pass blocking is actually up to par uh, when all is said and done. But I think Montgomery is going to be absolutely fantastic this year. I am super excited. And you know what? If the, if the best stat coming out of this season is going to be 0% on fourth down conversions and 0% on third down conversions, I'd be okay with that because Zero percent when you don't have third or fourth down is fantastic because five point nine yards of carry, that's second down only. I'm good with that all day long. <laughs> well done, Troy. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I, as a as a non Packers fan, the impression that I get about Mike McCarthy is that he in terms of his style of play, he's quite old school. I mean, you're you're one of the few teams that has a fullback. And I feel like Mike McCarthy is the guy that would like that pounding, well, like Eddie Lacey, like that once that three down pounding through the middle of that line running back. And that's the, he's really old school in that regard. And so it sort of seemed at times like he didn't really want to use Ty Montgomery, despite the fact that Ty was so successful, as you said, like 5.9 yards per carry. So it seemed like there's a little bit of resistance from resistance from Mike McCarthy. Did did you guys get a sense of that, or um, how do you feel about that in general? That's an easy answer. He was the only running back. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, if I'm the coach, I'm absolutely going to be very conservative with that because I don't know what's going to happen. He goes down, he gets hurt. Plus, he's not you know he hasn't practiced and prepped at that position during a full off season cycle, so he's not bulked up to the right weight and that sort of thing. So I don't think he was protecting him by any means from the sake of I wasn't sure if he could actually do the job. I think he was protecting him because he had nobody else to run. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of smash mouth football this year. We went big on the tight ends for that reason. Rupkowski is a great lead blocker, just like Kuhn was before him. So I I really expect to see that this year you're going to really see what these wide receivers can do because the passing game only works if the running game exists. And hopefully if we get enough of that offensive magic this year, maybe McCarthy will pull over a little bit of that Bill Belichick mindset and, you know, put his foot down on the throat of opponents because there's nothing like watching your team just take the second half off to make it pull out all of, all of your hair. Hey, go back. Go back to the 2011 season when the Packers were 15-1 and one, and take a look at Aaron Rodgers' uh, hold times in the pass passing game at that time versus what he does now. He's holding on to the ball longer because he has to make something happen in the passing game because there is no separation and there is no distance because they, everybody knows we're going to pass because they, there is no running game. If you go back and look at the running game in 2011 and what Aaron was able to do to get the ball out of the pocket in a one or three step drop and boom, that ball's out and then let the receivers do the run after the catch to pick up the yards. 
I think that's the kind of offense you're going to see out of the Packers this year. Oh, God. I don't. So Matt Ryan's coming for you, buddy. <laughs> so look, we'll go we'll go the wide receivers and, and the passing game. So Jordy Nelson, I don't think we really need to discuss Jordy Nelson. They got the guy's an absolute start and the comeback player of the year. Ninety seven catches, twelve hundred and fifty seven yards, fourteen TDs, the league's best. Then you have behind him the Surgence of Devontae Adams with 75, 997, and 12 TDs. I mean, he had five 100-yard games. And then the, the, the poor guy at number three, Randall Cobb, which showed so much. He's been hit by injuries, you know, some poor form, trying to hopefully, for you guys, trying to recapture that 2014 season. And then behind him, you just got like a slew of, of guys, uh, Jeff Janis, uh, Trevor Davis, Geronimo Allison, um, Max McCaffrey, uh, who was actually on the, the starting lineup for that title game against um, NFC title game. Who was that against? Um, <laughs> do you guys remember? No? No. no. I'm sure it was the bird team because we lost. Yeah, we always we... lose to the bird teams. <laughs> well, I can guarantee. Cardinals, we're... Seahawks, <laughs> Falcons. <sighs> Well, I can guarantee when we have our team preview with the um, the Patriots, uh, this room would be very quiet um, from, from one half of it anyway. So in the fifth round, you pick up uh, D'Angelo Yancey out of Purdue. The seventh round, you pick up uh, Malik, I can't even pronounce his name. Malachi. Dupree, Malachi Dupree yep. out of LSU. Who, uh, not a bad pickup, actually, in the seventh. And you've got a couple of undrafted free agents in Michael Clark, Monte Crockett, and uh, Colby uh, Pearson. So how does the uh, – outside of the, the top three guys, obviously, maybe you could, you could talk a little bit about their seasons. Probably Randall Cobb would be one that people want to know about, and Devontae Adams if he can keep it going. But just, just the whole receiving core in general. And, and who's going to – who will make it and who won't? Well, I honestly think that it's mainly about those top guys. I mean, it's great to have an embarrassment of riches and picking up some extra wide receivers in the draft because – you just never know. And Aaron Rodgers has shown time in and time out how he can make almost any wide receiver or tight end a star. So it's all about the the main guys. And I hope we can keep as many as we can. Troy does the best with the mathematical side of it of should we keep this many wide receivers when we cut down to 53 or should we go with more, you know, fullbacks or tight ends or whatever. But I, I think it's great that we have so many to just vie for the job because who – doesn't want to be a wide receiver for the Green Bay Packers and Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, and Geronimo Allison was really a big step up from last year. So I would take a look at Allison. And Jeff Janis, this guy, I mean, the, the fans love Jeff Janis for some reason. In in uh, preseason especially, he is just a 100% showboat out there. <laughs> so the fans just love Jeff Janis. He did catch one of those like really crazy Hail Mary passes. So he, he, he sticks around and you never know what's going to happen with Janice. He could be this year's breakout star. So, but uh, Geronimo Allison is, if, if Cobb can't pick, get back up into the swing of things uh, like that 2014 season, Geronimo Allison will certainly be there this year. What is it with about Cobb? Like he had the, was it a shoulder? He had the shoulder injury. It just fell away. He's, he's just not the guy he was. And it's only what, with two years coming into third, this will be, yeah, two, two years since, that 2014 so it's just where'd he go well it, it's not enough hoodie is the problem <laughs> no it, it just seems incredible from a guy from a an offense that threw the ball more than anybody has done and any more than uh Aaron Rodgers himself has ever thrown and Randall Cobb saw none of it basically well the, the real issue I'm sure is that when Jordy went down the type of game that Randall Cobb had to adjust to to pick up the slack. And then with Devonte Adams, not picking up the slack and having that slump in his second year, I think that's really where a lot of the challenges happen because your, your mind shifts. Right. And then I think some of that, maybe a little bit of doubt kind of creeps in. Like I'm not maybe as good as I thought it was in that, in that first couple of years. So I think with him being knowing that Jordy is in where he is knowing that Devonte is actually rising up to be back on the outside and you can get Cobb back in the slot where he needs to be in order to do those quick slant passes and just break out and run, I think Cobb will be perfectly fine this season. I think he's shooken off whatever he had going on before. But I really think that's what it was. I think it was the adjustment he had to make to be like the number one receiver 
and all the pressure that that comes with kind of maybe just shook him up a little bit. Exactly. All right, so we'll move on to the tight ends. And, mate, you go and pick up uh, Metellus Bennett, who's just a little bit of an upgrade over Jared Cook and Lance Kendricks from the Rams. Now, un- underrated Lance Kendricks, actually. A big part of the, of, of the Rams' offense for, for an offense that didn't have a, have a lot. So it's probably one of the probably is it is it the best receiving core that the Packers have had? Like I was a big I was a big fan of Jermichael Finley when he was there. I thought he was extremely athletic, uh, more uh, an oversized wide receiver that was uh, I thought at the time tough enough to play the tight end position. So mate, how, how do these two guys work in the offense? I, I think it's going to be a big surprise to see how we make use of them and Martellus Bennett. I, I, Jared Cook did great things for us, and I'm certainly going to miss him. But Martellus Bennett is, I think, a huge upgrade over Jared Cook. Even no offense to Jared Cook, who saved our bacon last season. Richard Rogers, don't forget him. He's uh, another Cal guy, so Rogers to Rogers, Cal to Cal. I think it's going to be good. <laughs> and Lance Kendricks, yeah, we, the the Rams. Lance didn't really get a chance, much like Jared Cook before him, to to really show what they can do when you're on a team like the Rams that really need to do a lot of work to figure things out. But uh, the fact that we have three, I think, solid tight ends, at least for now, I we could just do some crazy stuff out on the field, and these guys are just going to make it work. Yeah, Mark Chimura would be applauding right now. Superman's back. Mm, love that guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, let's go across to the defensive side of the ball, and this is where, obviously, there's been a little bit of attention paid this offseason. Certainly, when the Packers went to the Super Bowl in 2010, you had a top five unit in both scoring defense and total defense. And the, the defense hasn't really been ranked that high in either of those categories since since then. And certainly last year was the second worst in the league against the pass, as we, as we know. And I should really stop mentioning that was really exposed in the NFC Championship game. So... No, keep me- keep mentioning, sorry, keep mentioning it, keep mentioning it. What? <laughs> Is someone talking? Man, are you still there? Do we hang up on those guys? Now, your two top draft picks in 2015, Dem- Demarius Randall and Quentin Rollins, you know, they really played fairly inconsistently and there was injuries and things and it's the defensive backfield. So let's talk about the defensive backfield first and it's it's ironic that the two guys in the middle of that defense – in Morgan Burnett and Clinton Dix are, you know, really fantastic players. Obviously, you lost Micah Hyde. But, yeah, certainly picking up Kevin King and um, safety Josh Jones, who probably will be the heir apparent, I suppose, to Burnett, ultimately, and then releasing Sam Shields and obviously the loss of Micah Hyde. So that defensive backfield is undergoing a little bit of a change, or a little bit, quite a huge change. Um, how do you see the defensive backfield looking in 2017? Well, you really got to take a look at the fact that when you understand the amount of injuries the Packers had in the secondary last season, I don't want to take anything away. I mean, sometimes these guys really did play piss poor football in a lot of aspects of the game, especially when, you know, being there live I, and, I can't remember, Wayne, if you actually saw a game last year or not, but I know not I was at person. two. Not in person, right? It was the year before. But uh, I went to two last year, and there were just plays where people were getting burned left and right, just not turning on the ball properly, just really big fundamentals. And I think the issue was scheme, and Dom Capers was really trying to figure out, what the hell do I do with what I have? Mm. So, I, I mean, you know, to be in the NFC Championship game with as porous of a secondary as we had – and given that Dom was like literally making up plays every weekend <laughs> to try to make that happen, I mean, that's really a testament when you think about what they were able to do and put together. Um, now, that doesn't happen unless you have Aaron Rodgers as the quarterback. Let's not forget that, right? That wouldn't be happening if Cutler was throwing for the Packers. Uh, God forbid. <laughs> but uh, when, when you look at everything we have in place now, you have Devon House coming back, uh, previously in the organization back 2011, during a 15-1 and run where the Packers were all about the takeaway and scoring on the defensive side and the ball. So to have him playing on the outside, much more season, much more veteran, especially the whole, um, the story about how he got the, the ride from Minneapolis across the state from the two brothers. I mean, that Great just shows story. leadership and dedication 
to be able to get back and practice because he could have been a veteran and been like, ah, you know, sorry, guys, missed my flight. But he's really just playing on his Xbox in the hotel room. <laughs> but no, he <laughs> he truly made sure that he made that trip across to prove a point to Demarius and to Quinton and to Ladarius and said, no, I'm here to show up and I'm here to play because this is where I want to be, especially the with that, what he had happened down in Jacksonville the previous season. So I think Von House is going to really bring something to that secondary back unit as a leader, which will elevate Demarius Randall to have someone who can be the number one. So Demarius can go back to being an excellent number two, because he is an excellent number two. He's a mediocre number one, but he's an excellent number two. And that allows then of course you to rotate in Ladarius and Quinton and Kevin King inside of that slot receiver dime package, nickel package situation when it comes up and then wherever Josh Jones can land to kind of spell Morgan Burnett, I think that switching out there allows Haha ha Clinton Dix to be able to come up in the box a little bit more, uh, kind of like those olden days there, Wayne, uh, when oh, you had yeah. some sneaking up there, <laughs> little number 42 action. So uh, it'll it'll be interesting to see what's going to happen there with Mr. Dix. And I think he'll be an interesting one to watch this season to see if he could get in the backfield a little bit, put up a couple sacks on his name. But I think you're going to see a lot of takeaways this season because we have some height in the secondary again. And I think that'll be very interesting to see how that plays out. Can't wait. That's all I can add. <laughs> well, let's move. So it's kind of moving from uh, back to front because I guess the back was sort of the most urgent need. Now, in the middle of the field, obviously your star, Clay Matthews, has been moved around a little bit in an effort to try different things in the defense. And uh, Mike McCarthy has said that he's going to move him around this year rather than, than have him just be exclusively on the outside. And you've got Nick Perry, who led the team in sacks last year, and you're going to be hoping that he can kind of back up his season last year. And he was rewarded with a $60 million contract. Let's hope he can back that up. And then you've also got uh, J. Ron Elliott and Kyla Facknell, Fackrell, sorry, who probably need to elevate their games a little bit. So what, is, what does the middle of the defense look like? I'm just hoping that they're going to be able to stop things happening in the middle of the field. Uh, Kenny Clark in his, I believe, second year, he's from down the street in San Bernardino here in California. I think Kenny Clark's going to take huge steps. He's been posting a lot of great stuff on, you know, Instagram and Twitter and stuff. And I think he's going to make a good move and help shore up some things. It was still kind of a surprise when, oh uh, gosh, who was that nose tackle that surprisingly retired last year? Gosh, BJ. Oh, BJ Raji. I, mm-hmm. That kind of just threw a wrench in some of the plans because not many people were able to get around BJ Raji. And uh, sorry for forgetting his name there, BJ. But, you know, we just need to short things up. If we can keep things up in the front, uh, we did fairly well at least a year ago and some last season at stopping the run. It was those passes 20, 30 yards down the center of the field that really gave us trouble. And that's because of the pass, uh, pass rush. Like pass rush last year was almost non existent which is also the, that exposed the secondary because you can't stay with those receivers forever. I mean, their top-notch receivers are going to get open eventually given enough time. So when you go back to when Raji was on the team and you had Clay Matthews playing in the middle as the middle linebacker position, I think that was really interesting because we were stopping a lot of runs between Matthews and Raji in the middle. So if we have a, a good performance uh, coming out there from uh, Christian Ringo there at the nose tackle this year, I think that would be interesting to see Matthews move back to the inside, quite frankly, and let these guys with the speed like Freckle and um, Nick Perry and uh, Jerome Elliott get out there and do some damage because I think it'd be really, really fantastic because with, with that middle linebacker position, you need the speed to go left to right to stop the run. And Clay still has the speed. He just might not have the breakthrough tenacity that he used to have to be able to get through the the offensive line to the quarterback. So I'd rather have him use his speed side to side to be able to stop the run and plug the sweeps if it happens. Moving to the defensive line, uh, I mean, Mike Daniels is obviously the anchor of that, and but he, but he needs a bit of help. And you did already mention uh, last year's first-round pick, Kenny Clark, who needs to step up, and uh, Christian Ringo, so where I mean the pass rush is really coming from the outside and from the the linebacking core, but the D line, how is that shaping up? Well, I, I think you're going to see a, a big shift this year. I mean, when you have things like a Daniels and a Christian Ringo and a Kenny Clark being in there, you really have the ability to wreak some havoc. And I think 
understanding what they're going to be able to do to push through to get into that second level past the offensive line really is helped out by the fact that you have Dean Lowry and Montrevious Adams, uh, even maybe Reggie Gilbert back there or um, Ricky uh, Francois. You know, when you think about what they're able to do as far as spelling these guys and having a fresh front three uh, the entire time, that really is going to be a big help because before we just didn't have the depth that we needed to, especially at the defensive end position last year. I know Wayne and I talked about it in our draft episode in, in, in 16, like really we're only keeping like four defensive end or four defensive line people. Uh, that just seems like a bad move. So hopefully with the, the depth that we have now, maybe they'll decide to keep a few extra defensive linemen uh, when we get down to the 53 come Labor Day. So that pretty much wraps up, wraps up our um, our positions and all that. But I just want to ask you guys about the actual the franchise itself. Now, it's very unusual, the franchise um, in Green Bay, is that it's a, a fan-owned team, which for us here in Australia with our, with our football, they're all fan-owned teams. We've tried the, um, the privately owned and it, hasn't, it didn't really work here. But it's incredible for one of the smallest fan bases at the end of March 31 your total revenue was 441.4 million dollars now that's up eight percent from last year and it's just keep rising and rising since the team sort of redid up Lambo and all that's in 2003 it's just an, an incredible way that the, the the franchise is run could you just explain to the people here how it works that's a loaded question, isn't it, Wayne? <laughs> that one is tough to break down, especially since in Australia, you're, and you've got some wild Australian rules football going on. I've watched a few games last season. I'm thinking, these people are crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, we, here in America, in all of American sports, you know, basketball and hockey and baseball, really the Packers are the only team owned by the fans. You know, it's your own stock in the team, but you don't really get any profit from it. It's more of a pride thing because mm. – who else in America can go, can go around saying you're a part owner of the greatest team in all of professional sports in America, just Packers fans. So that's great. <laughs> and the fact that it's, it's amazing because Green Bay, Wisconsin is such a small market. It, I'm from Southern California. And when I go up there to Lambeau and Green Bay and the surrounding towns like Appleton, and it's just this great small town feel, small town community Almost everybody just seems so much nicer and it's just relaxed and you get great cheese curds, by the way. But it's just amazing that this great team and, you know, there were periods where we weren't so great, you know, up until Reggie White and Brett Favre came on the scene and helped rebuild everything. But ever since then, Ted Thompson, Mark Murphy, everybody in management, they've just been managing this thing like a machine. And if you ever get a chance to go to Lambeau Field and see it in its current state, and with the upcoming Titletown district that they're building, mm. it's just fantastic. And I would hope that within two, three years that the NFL draft, at the very least, can be held in the Titletown district. Yeah, this Titletown district is something that is some really to behold. I mean, I've been going up to games now for probably a good 10 years uh, since they moved every, all the games. They used to have three games played at, in Milwaukee about three hours south of Green Bay in what was the old Milwaukee Brewers baseball uh, stadium. And they said, you know what, we're losing all this revenue by having Milwaukee people down in Milwaukee. Let's make them drive up to Green Bay and spend their economic dollars up in the Green Bay area. And that'll obviously help us fund the team. And that's what started to help fund the, the Lambeau Field renovations. I mean, to be over 80,000 seats now with the addition of the new south end zone and the new scoreboards and extra uh, uh, press boxes and sky boxes and suites. I mean, it's just, it's still core football on inside the bowl. You're still sitting on a metal bleacher on concrete uh, and, and, and people will joke, right? They'll say, we don't, we just, we didn't know how big people were going to be in Wisconsin. Some people are a little bit larger because they eat a lot of meat and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Some people just wear lots of extra clothing because it's pretty darn cold up there in November and December. Uh, but it's just it's really fun to sit up there at Lambeau Field and watch a game and now to be able to extend that uh, basically west of the stadium back towards the freeway. It used to be all rundown commercial like Kmart and, and uh, Walmart and uh, the, the, all these like going out of business places, you know, they're getting put out by the online retail. So to buy all that, 
to have the cash, first of all, mm. to be able to buy all of that out and literally own everything from the stadium to the freeway and then to now entice people to come in and build inside what is now Titletown District, which just unveiled this logo uh, just recently. I mean, there's going to be a brewery there. There's going to be a hotel there, the Kohler Lodge. They're actually building um, a 35-acre uh, site. They're going to have a sledding hill and an ice skating rink. So literally you're talking about Packers fans can come up and enjoy the area all year round now. We thought that was exciting just with the atrium being built that you can come to the Packers Hall of Fame and, and the 1919 restaurant and take part in everything that goes on there with the pro shop uh, and, and the stadium tours. But now you can go literally just outside the stadium and go sledding and ice skating. And I mean, it's just going to make this a year round attraction. And then uh, what people don't know is that the, the town line of green Bay is literally right there at the stadium. So there's a smaller town right on the other side of the stadium called Ashwabanon. And really title town district actually sits in Ashwabanon. So green Bay, not to be outdone, they're actually now have plans on the other side of the stadium uh, is the is the practice fields like the Don Hudson Center and Rainichki Field, and, and once you get past the practice center, there's a whole bunch of industrial and a few uh, bars and stuff that go all the way out to the Tundra Lodge towards Brett Favre Steakhouse. All of that now is going to be completely redeveloped as what's going to be called the Legends District, and it's going to be a nice um, you know small housing community, commercial breweries, literally going to be a great place to hang out, especially if you're staying at the Tundra Lodge to be able to walk through that legends district over to the stadium. So by the time 2020 comes around, yeah, that, that the stadium district area is going to be completely unrecognizable to old time fans, but it's going to be a great place for Packers football in the future. And, you know, it makes a lot of sense because uh, Lambeau field for, for every, Oh, well maybe the fans of 31 teams, maybe Vikings fans might not agree, but I was going to say uh, Lambeau field <laughs> Is on the list, isn't it? It's like if, if you're going to do a bit of a tour of iconic stadiums, you got to go to Lambo, uh, and that you'd do that oh, yeah. in the off season, or I mean, you'd ov- obviously want to get to a game, but you'd go in the off season and check it out. It's just that iconic. Yeah, I mean, if you're thinking about like Taj Mahal, Statue of Liberty, <laughs> uh, Eiffel Tower, Lambo Field is like right there, one of those you know wonders of the world that you have to stop by at least once in your life. <laughs> Heck, even just the Packers Pro Shop that sells all of the souvenirs, that alone, my first time in the new Packers Pro Shop, I've seen gift shops nowhere near like this. It's the biggest, most amazing collection of Packers gear that you can spend lots of your hard-earned dollars on. It's just stunning. And the fact that you can get in and out of that place and still make it to your seat on time for the game is just a testament to the operation of not only the football operations run by Ted Thompson and, and Mark Murphy and everybody and how much that franchise just sings over the last you know quarter century, but the fact that even those types of operations like the Hall of Fame, like the Pro Shop, just run with such meticulousness and you know, to, you know top level of their game all the time just as a testament to what it is like to be a Green Bay Packer fan and work for the Packer organization. Now, we've been asking... Uh, the people we've been having on for our previews to give us a little bit of an indication of how they think their team is going to go in 2017, which seems like kind of a redundant question because yeah. obviously, you know, I mean, you lost Super Bowl the or bust. NFC Championship game. So, you, sorry, I mentioned it again. Uh, so, you, <laughs> so it's really going to be Super Bowl as the goal, obviously. But uh, I mean, how do you see 2017 shaping up? Well, we just have to look no further than the four beat reporters. Uh, that are actually covering the NFC North and all four beat reporters for ESPN have all agreed that there will be two NFC North teams in the playoffs this year. One of them most likely will be the NFC North division champion Green Bay Packers. So yes, we will be (laughs) champions once again in the playoffs. Once again, in the NFC title game, probably against a bird team again, (laughs) but this year, this year we're bringing a game. We're bringing bows and arrows and pellet guns. Birds are going down. <laughs> and this Hunting year, the season NFC, is open. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because the <laughs> NFC championship game will be in the frozen tundra of Lambeau Field this season. And I just feel like destiny is, is on the line here. I think we've got as many pieces as possible. I mean, last year, if we had any semblance of a defense, we would have 
you know, won and gone to the Super Bowl. So this year, I definitely think it's going to be a Packers and probably Raiders Super Bowl. And, nice. and let's be clear. The last time we won the Super Bowl, it was on Jerry Jones's brand new stadium on the Dallas Star, our longtime nemesis. <laughs> so to win the Super Bowl there, I think it's only fitting that we go into that purple monstrosity <laughs> yes. up there in Minneapolis and literally shove it in their face one more time. And of course, it uh, may be uh, the big focus really for a team that is as you know, primed as the Green Bay Packers is home field. Like how important home field is going to be in the NFC? All important. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you bring a team into Lambeau for, you know, if they have to go through Lambeau to get to the Super Bowl, well, you know, well, if they, if they beat you, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be hard yards. Mm-hmm. Ex- exactly. Especially since quite a few of the other NFC contenders, at least at this point, look to be, like indoor teams like the Falcons, like the Cowboys. And let's uh, make them come outdoors and enjoy some mid-January weather. Yeah, I was going to say, they're soft, aren't they? Those dome teams, they're soft as anything. <laughs> make them come out in the cold. Yeah, <laughs> Let's see what's, what they're made of. <laughs> but, and I went to school up there in Minnesota, so I know what it's like to be up in Minnesota. And I still have friends up there. So if this is the year we're going to the Super Bowl, then I'm going to go sit in that stadium and watch the Packers win the perfect 20 and 0 season. It'd be fantastic. Now, another a, a thing we've really been finishing off our team previews with is being has been asking our guests to nominate uh, what we're calling a step up player, which for you know you can frame it any way you like, but really a player that needs to step up their game in 2017. You guys can nominate one each if you'd like, or you could sort of go one on the offense, one on the defense, or you, you might have a consensus guy. But um, who do you think that might be? Uh, I'm for curious me, to see who Wayne picks, yeah. Because <laughs> I'm sure we both have totally different choices, which is fine. I'm going to go with Kenny Clark. He had a lot of promise coming out of college, and I, I think that uh, he is doing the work and is going to be the step-up player, at least on defense this season. I'm shocked because that is exactly who I was going to pick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> yeah, I think I think this year the Packers organization is going to live and die by that front seven on the defense. Mm. I think we did enough to actually secure the secondary. And if there's anybody that's going to do it, it's going to be him. He's got to have a real breakout season this year. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. Now, if only we could get the quarterback position a little bit better. Oh. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 50, yeah. 50 <laughs> touchdowns this year. Are bust. If Rogers can play us, if he, if he plays the whole year, like his second half, Last year, oh, wow! The whole—I oh, mean, the league is in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it just goes to show what he's capable of, doesn't it? I mean, two-time MVP for you know, I mean, obvious for obvious reasons. Exactly. Well, it's been fantastic chatting to you guys. Uh, we've been chatting to Troy and Wayne from the Packers Fan Podcast, and I'd encourage you to jump on and certainly you can give them a follow at Packers Fan Pod and you'll find links there to their actual podcast and you're a great listener as well guys and it's been fantastic chatting to you. Thank you so very much for having us on. Great times. Yes, totally love it and I just remind everybody out there to make sure you check out Packers.com and get involved with the fan community. There is a Packers bar everywhere in the world. So if you're looking for a place there anywhere in Australia, Europe, Russia, doesn't matter. Uh, just go to PackersAnywhere.com or PackersEverywhere.com. I can't remember which one it is, but check that out. You will find a Packer bar in at least every country for sure. Nice. And there's a big following. Uh, I, I mean, there is a worldwide following for the Packers. I mean, a lot of Packer, Packer fans here in Australia. We've got a lot of listeners in the UK. There's a big Packer following there. So, yeah, worldwide. Absolutely. And whenever I go to... Because I'm here in Southern California. If I go to a Chargers game when they're hosting the Packers or a Rams game and they're hosting the Packers, it is a thing of beauty to see the stadium turn into Lambeau West and be (laughs) approximately 50% or more green and gold. And in fact, not this coming season, but the following season, the Packers are coming back to L.A. to play the Rams. And I don't think they're going to know what hits them. It's just going to be beautiful. That football team will travel. Nice, nice. Oh, yeah, look, that was, that you, you do bring up a good point because the pack of fan base seems to be one of the ones, I don't know if there's any really solid stats on this, there probably is somewhere, but seems to be one of the fan bases that travels really willingly. 
you know, you can you can be sure that you know most home fields for teams will have a decent if if not as you said like in some markets like LA or southern california you'll have like a really a significant packer presence that's because all the san francisco people that were packers fans migrated from san francisco down to LA <laughs> they really wanted to support the team after they were getting their butts kicked up there every year <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, guys, we've, we've had you on the line for a long time, but it's been fantastic chatting to you. And uh, uh, obviously it was, it was tricky working out the timing because um, both of you guys are on different time zones and obviously we're a long, long, long way away. But uh, it's been well, well worth it and uh, it's been fantastic. So thank you very, very much. Bad. And remember, winter is coming. Go Pack Go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Troy Wayne. We'll let you go and uh, hope you uh, hope you guys can make it to Mercedes Dome, Mercedes Benz Dome, this coming <laughs> playoff. If you can get up there, that down there, that'd be great. Thanks so much, guys. All the best. All right. Hope you enjoyed that. That was our Green Bay Packers preview with the guys from the Packers Fan Podcast. They were fantastic, weren't they, G? Very cocky. <laughs> well, you can yeah, be yeah, when you you're can. a Packers fan. Uh, you can. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, when you have Aaron Rodgers at quarterback, you can, you can afford to be. Every year's a, a year to look forward to, isn't it, really? And the receiving call that they have this year is just yeah. outstanding. And look, they're a likeable team. I mean, you can't – I don't begrudge them that. I like watching the Packers. How well, can the, you not wa- like watching Aaron Rodgers? Uh, it's, and a whole, it's a whole publicly owned – thing that really um, appeals yeah well it yeah. relates to us yes and i think maybe to australians maybe if you're to lay out all the teams in front of them and and you see the green and gold oh yeah that's, thing, that's right you know the whole lambo field uh yeah the whole tundra and you know playing the freezing cold and seeing that from here when it's summer for us yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing yeah. to watch for sure well that's another team preview in the books um, and we're moving along, and I know we're getting we're getting some great feedback, G. And I hope that we are helping the off season travel a little bit quicker for you. And we're almost there. If you're by the time this one comes out, training camp's not going to be far away. So yeah, we're getting there. We we'll start to get exciting. Unfortunately, we have a Patriots coming up soon, don't we? Oh yeah, at some point. Oh. Yeah, that'll be hard for you, I know. But anyway, be very silent podcast. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, let's let's. Um, Round this one out, G. Thanks for listening. Really appreciate it. On behalf of G and myself, catch you next time.